The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, welcome back. Uh, we just finished uh, our discussion of predator prey and host parasites, illustrating it with uh, uh, ways that we could have an impact on uh, ecological modeling in oceans and, and in uh, public health. And these kind of considerations start getting us into what are the global and socioeconomic considerations. What, are the, what kind of impact do these kind of uh, models have on how we make decisions? And in this context, I, I, I'm glad to be associated with the Genome Project. It's one of the first scientific projects of any reasonable scale that, that uh, had from the very start from the very first proposed uh, funding for it uh, in 1990, a, uh, a component, uh, a 3 percent set aside for ethical, legal, and social issue, and, or ELSI. And some of the topics that are covered by the grantees in this part of the Genome Project um, were uh, genetic non-discrimination, privacy, reproductive rights, and cloning, psychological stigma that can come from maybe too much knowledge. Uh, clinical quality control, what can happen with false positives and false negatives in uh, clinical exams. Safety environmental issues, such as the ones we were just talking about and some more that I'll raise. Um, uncertainties, not just due to quality control, but in, uh, the uncertainties in, in testing minors. Um, issues of diversity both biodiversity and uh, human diversity. And uh, commercialization of the products. Who owns my cells when I, when I give them to a, a hospital or a company to help cure me? Do they then own all the patent rights? Now in terms of, so, so the underlined topics uh, are the ones, the four underlined topics we'll talk about in the next few slides. In terms of non-discrimination, this can go any direction. It will go the direction of market forces push it, meaning the voters, um, if we want to uh, pass really laws that say that if, that if George Church sequences his genome, then he has to report that sequence to the insurance company, or worse yet, the insurance company just go and get it whether he wants it or not. But on the other end of the spectrum, and I hope uh, the, the trend, which will make it much easier for us to share our data and or use our data, what's it, is that uh, Genetic non-discrimination in Health Insurance and Employment Act was uh, stopped in uh, 1999, was introduced and passed, uh, um, which, which would extend uh, employment protections in the, corp in the government sector to the private sector um, um, to the extent that that can be uh, uh, generalized. I don't know exactly where that's going, but one can hope that, uh, I mean, clearly we will always do some kind of discrimination based on uh, uh, genetics, that's, which can be assessed, um, you know, such as uh, uh, in an interview, you know, height, friendliness, that sort of thing, but we, but we won't necessarily be doing it based on genetic sequence. Um, and these are tough, these are tough issues, you know. Is the probabilistic nature of the decisions that you make during an interview different from the probabilistic uh, decisions you would make based on a DNA scan? Which is more accurate? Do you want it to be more accurate? Do you want it to be less accurate? So on and so forth. But clearly, the, the trend in terms of uh, legislation is towards uh, less information being used for discrimination. Certainly in the insurance level. And, the, and that's appropriate in insurance uh, because in a way that's supposed to be a, a uh, process by which 
risk is shared. So the issue of races. Typically races, uh, uh, some people feel this is a scientifically rigorous definition, others do not. Some feel that it involves you know, very, you know, very broad strokes uh, in, in other uh, organisms, at least. It can, it can cover fairly detailed um, bottlenecks in populations. But in any case, um, there are elements of population structure which certainly are important, whether you ascribe it to the major races or to um, uh, you know, minor, uh, smaller populations. And examples here, we've already talked about hemoglobin variants uh, evolved to resist malaria. This is going to be one of the themes today. Um, uh, and as with the differences in skin pigmentation, the pressure of the environment to develop a group-wide trait was powerful and, uh, and can, can involve a very small number of genes. You get founder effects where a, where a particular population um, is highly enriched for a particular disease, such as Huntington's in the case of the uh, Lake Maracaibo in Venezuela or Tysacks in, in uh, some Jewish populations. So when you have these well isolated populations, I think you can see in the population genetic literature how they can be used uh, in, in various ways. But overall, and at sort of at the broadest level, uh, we all share uh, a large set of commonly acquired um, polymorphisms. And even within the smallest subpopulation, it still behooves us to look at the details of the individual variations in DNA sequence and the haplotypes or genotypes. Now, I have two danger slides in a row. Uh, I could probably come up with quite a few more, so could you. But one of them is, you know, this is really a uh, very strong advocate for, for modeling. I mean, it's, it's totally anecdotal why itself is modifying because it's historical. But this is one critic's view of uh, the huge influence that Lysenko had on genetics and biology in the Soviet Union um, from the early days of the revolution. And his uh, real uh, pet theory was the inheritance of acquired characteristics. And there's nothing intrinsically wrong with, in broad strokes, the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Uh, it's not, certainly not common biological phenomenon. And at the time, uh, it, was, it, was, uh, not, it was not helping their biology progress at the same rate as the rest of the world, which was mainly pursuing the Mendelian inheritance um, models. And this critic, in quotes, uh, felt that his habit was to report only successes. This is a really feel-good habit. And his results were based on extremely small sample sizes, inaccurate records, and the almost total absence of control groups. He made an early mistake in a calculation which caused comments among other specialists in his field and made him extremely negative towards the use of mathematics and science. You know, making mistakes should not, you know, cause you to um, drop the use of mathematics and science. Hopefully, those of you, hope, probably everybody in this class has made a mistake in mathematics, and hopefully none of you will drop <laughs> mathematics in your future biology. And uh, the second danger is the danger of ethics-free science. I think this is a truly remarkable uh, story that uh, in 1979 there was a release of anthrax 836 spores in uh, part of the former Soviet Union. Uh, and a, a few years later, uh, actually 1999, this book was published uh, uh, describing what was behind that. It, uh, what was behind that was uh, decades earlier, in 1953, there was a leak uh, in one of, I guess, in one of their uh, anthrax uh, uh, developments. And in uh, 1956, they found that one of the rodents that they captured in their routine uh, surveys of the sewers, searching down uh, possible anthrax, 
that uh, they had actually, a strain had become much more virulent than the original that they were working with. And, uh, you know, usually the response of a public health uh, official or even a reasonable person would be to kill this thing. But instead, they, uh, they decided that hey, this was great, you know, this is, this is, let's cultivate it. And they, and they almost, the, the idea was to install it into um, these uh, uh, rockets that were targeted on Western cities. And then that led eventually to them uh, depositing spores on their own people accidentally of this uh, greatly enhanced strain. So the question, you know, to to our community as, as genome engineering tools get easier and easier, where you basically can sequence genomes inexpensively and even synthesize genomes inexpensively, and much of this is going to be in the public domain, what is to stop this from being a very easily disguised and um, uh, potentially very inexpensive um, form of terrorism. And part of that is that, you know, we do what we can do to improve either detection tools or genome engineering tools to make them um, more of a defense type than uh, offense. But uh, this, this was done in the early days of recombinant DNA where the vectors were designed so, such that if, if the vector ever were to escape from the lab, it would die immediately. It would be lacking the nutrients it needed to grow. It would be very sensitive to detergents that occur, typically in sewers and so forth. Now, the vectors we use today, those were not very robust. They didn't grow very well in the lab, as much less as the sewers. Uh, but it turns out that, that random release is a fairly low uh, risk problem. That was what we were worried about in the 1970s uh, with a common DNA. But, but purposeful release of uh, genetically modified organisms is more of the issue today. And of course, the genetically organi modified organisms on this slide have been created and engineered over the millennium, maybe uh, 10 millennium or so, uh, without uh, a license. Um, and they've been very successful. You take this little weed-like thing at the top left, um, and you end up with this great, you know, Fourth of July corn on the cob, and the hybrid corn, and uh, similarly uh, these dogs that range over the uh, three logarithms in an adult mass uh, would barely be recognized as the same species if we didn't know them and love them very well. Uh, but these are examples of, of uh, genetic engineering that was done pre-genomics, um, but now when we use recombinant DNA in particular, but genetic, you know, any kind of interspecific uh, genetic modification, this definitely raises the uh, environmental uh, issues, especially in the developing, oh, sorry, in the, uh, you know, say European nations where they are wealthy and they don't need much improvement in their uh, agricultural needs and uh, their but some of the developing world has very definite needs for genetic, or feel they do, for genetically modified organisms. Some of these include producing vaccines in plants. Vaccines are one of the most cost-effective ways of, of generating public health uh, results, but possibly even more effective would be to have uh, your bananas and other crops contain vaccines. And this, these have actually been developed, but it's been hard getting them actually uh, supplied uh, due to concerns about release of genetically modified organisms, possible um, allergic responses and so forth. Salt and drought tolerance is extremely important. Um, they they co often come together and there are a, a huge number of drought and salt tolerant plants, uh, so-called resurrection plants, about a hundred different, completely different uh, species, uh, which to provide new genes that can be introduced into non-drought tolerant plants and are being introduced by scientists in the developing worlds, uh, such as Africa. Terminators were originally, you know, it was like this popular, unpopular, popular again. Uh, they were uh, popular with the companies that developed them be, uh, for reasons that, you know, we'll, uh, we may not know, but it, uh, eat, 
but there, there, but there was the concern, the, the backlash was the companies are doing this to preventing, a, preventing the farmers from reseeding. By ter the terminator meant that, that uh, the next generation seeds would be useless. And it had been the habit of, far of, a, new, uh, of a farmer to reseed. And so then the terminators didn't sell for a while. But then, because of the worry about dispersal of genetically modified organisms, now the terminators are becoming more uh, interesting again to a broad set of people. You talk about organic farming. Uh, there is controversy as to whether the Titus definition of this, which involves no, inter no inorganic fertilizers like uh, uh, you know, nitrates and phosphates and so forth, um, but that means a very high animal load. High animal load means you need to use up a lot of your vegetable crops in order to produce the fertilizer for the other vegetables. And it should be pointed out that natural is not necessarily harmless. A, a, a wide variety of uh, naturally occurring compounds, natural pesticides, are also carcinogens. And here's the laundry list at the bottom of slide 43. Uh, cloning and stem cells. Uh, we have problems with cloning, um, definitely, in almost every species, even the successful ones. There are a variety of species which have been tried and not succeeded. There's some that have been tried. And if you look at the studies in detail, there are examples of developmental defects higher than expected in that species. Um, you know, ranging from uh, a few percent on up. And obviously there's some kind of epigenetic reprogramming that's, uh, that's occurring here where you're not getting all the right contributions from the maternal and the paternal genomes. And this can be possibly studied with expression pro profiles. We can start employ employing all of our automation to, uh, to analyze how we can increase the fraction of stem cells that go um, um, uh, that, that we can take adult cells and send them into different lineages or we can uh, 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 formulate ways to, to either transform one adult stem cell into another or an adult stem cell into a slightly more primitive stem cell uh, uh, and still retain the advantages of, of uh, so-called uh, uh, therapeutic cloning, which would be um, to um, uh, to maintain good histocompatibility, say, with the patient. So finally, education. Why should we bring up education in a course? Uh, we've talked about models of decision making in public health. Um, and, uh, but there's also a similar set for uh, education. Uh, we want to be able to deal with uncertainty, complexity, quantitation. I'm sure that I have introduced, or we have introduced plenty of uncertainty, complexity, quantitation in your lives with this course. I apologize for the parts that are painful. I hope that no pain, no gain has some applicability here. Uh, we want to, a theme in this course has been to uh, cherish your exceptions. Collect them and, uh, and these can be discoveries. They are at least going to keep you honest and keep you from making uh, uh, big mistakes. Uh, we want to be able to, to uh, translate from one data type to another, from one conceptual foundation to another, to integrate different, either adjacent conceptual spheres or very distant ones. When we do this, slide 47, we have, we need to have measures of our progress, measures of the quality of the underlying data and the models. And uh, we've already done this uh, to some extent, basically, for, for three-dimensional structures and sequence data, the prim primary and tertiary information. Uh, for uh, extra diffraction, this dates back into the 60s. We have measures of data quality include resolution, uh, model quality, which is the R factor we talked about before. We have ways of doing similarity searches. For sequencing, a more recent 
enterprise, sort of in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, we got the Genome Project launched with uh, thoughts of measuring data quality in terms of discrepancy per base pair. That should be less than one part in 10 to the fourth. Uh, the models typically are models of protein conservation and a similarity search is one of the greatest uh, killer applications of all times, which is blast. And then for function, we're uh, less far along. Uh, we don't really have accession numbers, as I said. We don't really have uh, uh, great uh, ways of doing similarity searches through, uh, say, image databases or similarity searches uh, other than, say, correlation uh, coefficients. But I think this is rapidly changing. When we start applying these models, this is not only in the education and uh, sense, but in the probing these networks that we've been talking about even further beyond consideration of, of uh, neural networks and uh, our interaction with other organisms, uh, kind of combining those two the neural networks and our interaction with other organisms with ecology is this notion of biophilia, which is that we as human beings and other uh, fairly intelligent animals are connected subconsciously to other living beings. Uh, it is clear that no matter how urban or what culture you're talking about, snake dreams figure in very prominently. And this has to do with the need of primates to avoid and track snakes when they're in the vicinity of the tribe. Little animals are cute, but we just know that. Uh, and they're much cuter than the adults, no matter what the animal is, we talk with such a snake. And, uh, <laughs> and it's, it, you know, there are, there are, you know, uh, anecdotal at least, possibly well characterized uh, effects of the fr green fractals that we like to see. And, and taking this one step further from just this, this kind of very stimulating thought that we actually have co-evolved, our nervous system has co-evolved for so long with these other things, it would be natural for us to be very attuned to them because our survival would have depended upon our ability to avoid snakes and to deal uh, with um, green versus brown shrubs. And uh, if you take that one step further, many, much of what we do in the humanities, say, um, is affected our aesthetic and our approaches to it and our beliefs are affected by this heritage. And this is what E.O. Wilson has championed. And I, I would say it's quite controversial, as it should be. Um, but in general, long separated fields come together. This is the consilience definition. And they create new insights like uh, chemistry and genetics brings us more like the biology. And the question is, is all of human endeavor ready for such a thing, from religious feelings to financial markets and so on? And if, and whether or not, how might genomics and computational biology contribute? It's surprising sometimes when these things, when things do contribute. And here's some speculation on that. We have improving imaging methods. We talked about imaging in the context of in situs. Uh, some very functional uh, versions of this are positron emission tomography and magnetic resonance imaging, which allow you to, m to monitor such things as blood flow or uh, metabolic uptake uh, in, in uh, different parts of, a, of an actively meta metabolizing brain. And here you can inject uh, some uh, O15 labeled compound and you can get an image resolution on the order of nine millimeters, okay? So the, the voxels here, volume elements, um, are, are not are, uh, limited in that range. And sort of in the 20 seconds uh, is sort of the time frame that you're working in. And this has been applied to a whole variety of interesting uh, behavioral tasks. Um, almost anything you can think of, counting, memory, so forth in humans, and you can map the parts of the brain that are differentially uh, responsive to a control and an experimental time frame for the same patient and the same apparatus. And here, this is just to show you how far it can go and connect to what we were talking about on the previous slide. Here, uh, re religious subjects, patients, 
have been um, the, the differential uh, parts of the brain monitored here um, are in a religious recitation process and in a resting control. And these are all the um, p less than p to the 0 0.001 um, significance by the, the you know, very complicated uh, uh, statistics that are used in the uh, analysis of these functional maps. Now, not, not to just leave us on that note, uh, but to connect it more to genomics and uh, computational biology as is, you know, more in the heart of this course, uh, here's an example of how magnetic resonance imaging uh, which can be applied to gene expression. How we bring these two together, kind of imaging gene expression. And one of the powers of this, in contrast, the po positron emission tomography had about a, a 9 millimeter resolution. This has a 10 micron resolution, sort of in the optical resolution range. But unlike optical uh, methods, this will work for intact opaque organisms. Uh, and Finally, so MRI will do that in general, but to connect it to gene expression, you need to tag the gene expression such way. And we know we have green fluorescent protein, we have you know, other color fluorescent proteins, we have luciferase, beta galactosidase, and so forth. One of those has to be turned into something that has sufficient contrast in magnetic resonance imaging. And an example of that is a way of caging a, a gadolinium ion such that you can see this little galacto pyranose ring at the top right is covering it, and the little red bond there is cleaved by beta galactosidates, lax Z fusions. And so you can now make your same reporter constructs that have been used in making, you know, say, blue cells with a, with a colorimetric indicator with optical wavelengths. Well, now with magnetic resonance imaging, release that gadolinium so it's now accessible to the solvent, has a different uh, resonance, and you can get sharp contrast here. In a living organism on the top, a 10 micron resolution as opposed to a fixed organism which is required for getting the uh, whole mount in C2 staining with lax C. So I think this is a very interesting combination of being able to use something you know alive uh, in opaque tissue with, uh, with a uh, genomic tag of sorts. We will, you know, on that religious note, we will uh, sort of did, uh, wrap up the course, and uh, the, my part of it, the, the, uh, the lecture part, and in so doing, I want to especially give many, many thanks, not just to this year's TS, which we will get to in just a moment, but the ones that helped uh, start this phase of the course, actually the course goes back to 88, but um, these are some of the uh, teaching fellows in 1999 and 2000, 2001, uh, one of these uh, teaching fellows, Suzanne Camilli, uh, has uh, stayed with us as a head teaching fellow this year. She moves up to the top. Of, and I'm very thankful to everyone here, Woody, June, Lan, Tom, John, uh, Yong Hong, Gary, and Laxman. If any of you are here, could you kind of stand up with us? Just wave. Thank you very much. I really, I love it. And uh, if this course is to continue to survive, um, we need TFs for next year. Uh, so if any of you feel that you have the right stuff and feel that this course should survive, um, please contact <laughs> us. <laughs> uh, hopefully, that will be some finite positive number. Uh, we really love the projects, and we'd love. To, uh, and in the past, stu many students have been uh, reluctant to stop working on the project after the course is over and their grade has been assigned, and so forth. And uh, and that nothing could make me happier than to have you do that. There's a limit to just how much I can help you do that, but if, if anything I can do to help providing additional mentoring and so forth, I'd love to do that. Uh, some of these have even resulted in publications later on. We started this course, slide four of the first lecture, actually the first real slide of the first lecture, was on the origins of zeros and ones. Uh, the, you know, 
kind of a, a play on the 101 course number. Where did the binary code come from? And you could ascribe it to Leibniz or one of the you know modern uh, uh, 18th century mathematicians, but Leibniz himself found that it had already been invented about 5,000 years ago or so uh, uh, by China's first emperor. And uh, since then, some people have gone so far as to take this binary coding, the uh, I Ching, uh, which has 64 hectograms, and has arranged it in such a way that it uh, has decoded it so that it actually fits in with the genetic code, which has 64 codons. <laughs> so for those of you who are students of the I Ching, it hopefully now has new meaning for you. <laughs> and, uh, and to emphasize this, this yin and yang symbol here, remember that the purpose of having the black dot in the white zone and the, and the reciprocal white dot in the black zone is to remind you that things are not just black and white. They're not just zeros and ones. They have more complexity and they are constantly in change. This is the book of changes, and this course is about change. And you should, when you do computational biology, it's not just about computation. It's not by keeping yourself busy at the computer, keeping your computers busy all the time. It's about thinking, thinking as broadly as you can. So, thank you very much.